uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining the call. Uh, I hope you all had a wonderful weekend and ready to kick off the second week of the fantastic Airflow um, Summit. Thanks a lot for all the organizers. Uh, very quickly, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Amin al uh, I grew up uh, back in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, I have approximately, uh, well, 12 plus years of experience so far in the IT world. Tens of projects, open source, commercial, uh, a multitude of cultures that I had to deal and work with, uh, whether from my hometown, Cairo, um, or through Europe and the States. Um, thanks a lot for joining and yeah uh, as the title suggests during this uh, talk we will be talking about how we brought uh, airflow into a production environment in the autonomous driving field and how it's uh, how 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 it's basically used um, throughout the pipelines the different pipelines we are having what challenges we faced and what um, how our solutions actually looks like um so basically, uh, quickly, uh, uh, me and my, uh, myself and Michal Dura, uh, my co-speaker in this uh, talk, we both work at DXC. Uh, very briefly, DXC is an independent end-to-end -end IT um, solutions company uh, where we uh, assist and help different customers worldwide to um, to basically deliver all the deliver all the services and basically address all the challenges that challenges that they are looking for. We operate from more than 70 countries worldwide with more than 100,000 um, employees, uh, skilled talents uh, with different uh, different backgrounds and different uh, specialities, assisting customers uh, thrive to change and deliver um, deliver their, um, basically uh, address their IT challenges. Um, Jumping next, though, basically the title of this talk says autonomous driving with airflow. Let's start quickly with describing what airflow is, uh, what autonomous driving is. So with autonomous driving, it's basically, um, we, we we are looking forward that, that at the long run, um, vehicles will be driving around in the, in the streets co completely autonomously. So no interaction from the passenger. If we look in the past, tens of, ten, 10 years ago or even more 20 years ago, so in the beginning, vehicles had to had, had required the full attention of the driver, no no assistance from uh, from any of the softwares, no assistance from no assistance from the from, from the vehicle itself. So basically, um, the driver had to um, control the vehicle mechanically and maneuver through all the challenges he is having. And then when we speak about autonomous driving, so uh, out of out in the industry, there are five levels of autonomous driving. The first one would be feet off, and that's cruise control. Probably some of you already drove some of these vehicles where you can, on the highways, set uh, set the um, set the cruise control on a particular speed, but still you have to maneuver left and right. You have to give turn signals, and you have to, of course, avoid uh, avoid any accidents, if any. Um, second level is basically partially automated, where maybe uh, we can say assisted parking, where you can like find a parking slot uh, spot, and then um, as soon as you begin to park, the car gives you the option: Would you like me to park the car for you? And that's when, if you say yes, then you can just pull your hands, hands and legs uh, away, and the car would automatically um, park itself. Level three is basically eyes off. So uh, the car would drive in the streets. It would uh, speed up. It would slow down when necessarily. It would turn left and right. But that might be only limited uh, to the highways, not yet in the city. Uh, level four would be much more automated. So you can basically fully relax back, uh, watch the car as it's moving around left and right and so on, exactly as if you are... Uh, on a roller coaster where you have absolutely no, uh, your, your input is actually not considered for the car. And level five for the autonomous driving vehicles would basically be cars that are out there driving alone. Um, no passenger even is sitting there, no driver is sitting there, fully automated. So autonomous driving is is an is an is a very interesting field. Uh, we already probably know um, a couple of car makers out there who are. Um, who are uh, producing vehicles, maybe some of them already capable of driving alone. And um, but nevertheless, the continuous development and the, and the machine learning and the reprocessing of the data and so on, this is all our topics that requires uh, 
requires a lot of resources and a lot of efforts to bring it in, in, in a safe fashion that it could actually drive alone in the streets. So for the auto, for the automotive industry in general, there is a lot of research and design, uh, research and development efforts going into this direction. If basically the graph on the left hand side, we can see that in the past, uh, a lot of efforts were directed towards the mechanical engineering of the vehicles, then a little bit uh, less efforts towards the electronics, uh, electronical engineering of the vehicles. Slowly, software engineering started to tweak in and try to do, for example, these fuel consumption estimations and so on. There is information technology, and eventually there is the machine learning, which slowly and slowly started to tweak in. But as we evolve nowadays, we can see that, um, of course, mechanical engineering and electronic engineering, they still have a huge uh, stake on the development of vehicles. But we can obviously see that machine learning and artificial intelligence are basically getting a bigger and bigger stake into the future of the vehicles. And that's basically where autonomous driving starts to kick in and starts to take a, a, a lot more um, importance and a lot more um, stake into the de development of the vehicles in general. Um, at DXC, we have the DXC Robotic Drive Program. And for that, uh, this is kind of specialized in enabling customers uh, develop and enhance their, uh, their efforts and the research and development efforts in the autonomous driving field. And for that, uh, we, we, we provide a lot of solutions. I mean, it starts from the data collection and the ingestion of the data. Uh, that comes directly from the vehicles, from the disks inside the vehicles and getting them into the platform, uh, storing them, and then afterwards, uh, well, a lot of applications kick in. There's the applications that check on the quality of the data. There's applications that check of the, on the geographic locations of the data and uh, simulation jobs and reprocessing. And there is a lot of stuff. There is, a lot, there is really a lot of pipelines that need to to kick in once the data is received from the car until the point when the cars can really go out in the streets and start driving, whether assisted or completely alone. And for that, we can see in the pipe, there is the map up, and then there is the simulation of the different simulation scenarios. and. Upon performing some simulations, we you obviously de detect that oh no, this is not the this is not the learning model that I'm looking for, and I need to I need to improve my model, for example, a little bit, and then you need to re reimplement your model and then retrain it and then rerun your simulation jobs and see is it getting any better? You need to measure some KPIs to see if if in, if if eventually you are driving towards the direction you're looking at or not. Um, once once all this gets in a better shape, of course, you need to go to the authorities, to the local authorities, and to um, basically get the approval for such for such uh, for such a vehicle to go in the streets. For example, in Germany, you are required by 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 the by the authorities to uh, simulate uh, to simulate that your models have driven in the streets for millions of kilometers. I, I actually don't remember if it was uh, 2.5 million kilometers or 25 million kilometers. Some of them simulated and some of them actual before your, before your vehicle can get the approval and go into the streets. And for that, uh, we at Robotic Drive at DXC, we work with a multitude of automotive uh, customers in Germany and also worldwide, where we deliver the platform which is used for the simulations of for the computation, for the data storage and all that stuff uh, to make sure that the customer basically doesn't really have to worry about the platform anymore, doesn't have to worry about um, all the internals and the infrastructure stuff, but they have to basically concentrate on the machine learning stuff, on the, the modeling, on the data ingestion, on to the cleaning of the data and all that stuff. So for one of our use cases, we actually have built up a high performance data driven platform. This is, this was one of the, this was actually one of the best projects I ever worked on. So in that, in that platform, we actually built a platform from scratch bottom up in three months where we have a hundred thousand cores. Uh, we need to store more than 200 petabytes of data. We need to be able and be capable of processing uh, multiple petabytes of data per day. Um, and all that stuff doesn't go um, 
doesn't just happen very easily. So we first had to build the platform and we need to provide some of the services that runs on the platform that would assist our customer to, to deliver such value. The technology stack of our um, and with the multiple technologies that the customer would be looking for and would be helpful for the customer to deliver what they need. And basically this brings us to the meat of this presentation, Airflow. Uh, how we use Airflow in autonomous driving. Um, Airflow is currently, I mean, everyone probably knows here that Airflow is an orchestration engine. And here we use it to um, to orchestrate all these different pipelines and all these jobs running on the platform on these at, at, at such a large scale that eventually the result of these uh, Airflow uh, jobs is basically the reprocessing and the simulation and the ingestion of petabytes of data every day. We have uh, such. Uh, we have we we have a setup that started a year and a half ago. Uh, it emerged a lot since we started until we reached the stage at at which we are at uh, at today. Uh, we have Airflow deployed on top of OpenShift Kubernetes. Uh, obviously, we have one scheduler instance running at the time. We see this as a big risk for obvious reasons. We have multiple web servers running in parallel, load balanced, accepting REST API calls uh, to to to, manu to basically manipulate the different tags we are having. And we have numerous words uh, distributed over multiple queues, each of them dedicated for a separate, um, separate stack of jobs. Um, I, again, in a nutshell, so we have uh, our deployment of Airflow is based on Helm charts. Uh, it's, it's, we see we we implemented it in such a way that it's highly customizable. So we store different configurations of different Airflow instances uh, in, in in configuration files. So we are actually in multiple instances of Airflow concurrently, and uh, obviously we use uh, uh, version control and Git repository for history tracking to see how our um, basically this helps us track our changes, our deployment changes, and how this affects the overall performance of Airflow. These Helm charts also allow us to deliver on-demand Airflow instances, which uh, maybe some can spin up and purposes and test some configuration parameters and see if this brings better or worse performance for Airflow. Um, Next would be, I mean, with such a huge platform, we needed, we had to integrate Airflow with uh, the data and storage platform, which is in our particular case based on MapR. Uh, basically, the end users would need to run some Spark jobs, some uh, ingestion jobs uh, from Airflow. This needs to be orchestrated via Airflow. We read our DAGs from the MapR file system. This allows the end users who have uh, access rights to deploy their DAGs directly there, and they are automatically picked up by Airflow. And we load some job configurations uh, for the different operators, for example, for the Spark submit operator, Kubernetes operator, Kubernetes pod from the MapR file system. Uh, we also integrate with our compute platform, which, as I mentioned, is based on OpenShift. So uh, we have Airflow deployed on OpenShift, and we also have jobs from the customer running on OpenShift. Uh, and here we rely mainly on the Kubernetes pod operator. We, we we still see some performance issues there, but we are trying to address this together with the community to to uh, user experience uh, with with Airflow in general. Um, then last but not least, uh, we also built our Airflow with some matrix collection and monitoring. So we use the StatsD exported matrix from Airflow. Uh, we pull them into Prometheus, and out of that, we can build some um, nice dashboards, which basically allow us to continuously monitor 24-7, uh, uh, see what if, if, if elements require any additional resources, if there is some components that are not acting as expected. Um, yeah. and with monitoring always comes the log collection and aggregation. So we use Elasticsearch and Kibana for that. It's quite a complex, complex setup. In general, what we are aiming at at the long term is a large scale orchestration. So we are aiming at orchestration jobs at the scale of 100,000 tags uh, a month. Uh, these jobs uh, would include ingestion, simulation, reprocessing, machine learning, and the cycle keeps on going and going and going until eventually the cars would hit the streets, hopefully next year. Um, I think that will bring 
the introduction part to an end, and I would like to hand over to Michal for an introduction and to carry on from there. Thank you. Hi, welcome everyone. So uh, my name is uh, Michal Dura. I'm working at DXT as a big data developer, and since uh, last year, I'm also involved in the Apache Airflow um, uh, work related to Apache Airflow. And today, uh, I would like to give you some small uh, introduction how our Airflow setup looks like, what kind of technical challenges we faced, and how our journey with Airflow uh, basically uh, looked like and why we implemented it in a way that, that we are using it right now. So, okay. Uh, so the first thing that uh, should be worth to, to mention is why have we chosen Airflow? At the very beginning uh, of something like one and a half year ago, when we considered a scheduler that should be uh, picked up uh, in the robotic drive platform, uh, we considered many uh, schedulers which are available. But uh, basically, we uh, we we uh, uh, specified few non-technical requirements that are very important for us. The first one is that we were interested in the open source solution uh, because uh, it might be the case that at some point we will face some requirement that is not handled by the default implementation and we would like to extend it and uh, have a freedom to basically adapt some, some code based on our needs. So this was basically the main requirement here. We would like to have a scalable, scalable solution. So the scalability was also very important because uh, we wanted to have this flexibility to adapt the orchestrator if our platform will be bigger and if it will uh, need to handle much more work, uh, workflows and, and uh, handle much more uh, data in the future. Uh, and what was also very important is that uh, the tool will be supported by the active community. So uh, basically it means that um, with active community, it always means that uh, all open and known issues will be quickly addressed. And there will be some uh, good uh, place to find some support and needed if some troubles uh, will be experienced in the future. So that was also something we considered as a very important thing. And uh, right now, looking uh, from the from the little bit different way, uh, we should answer a question: uh, What do we want to orchestrate? So looking at the data perspective, as Amr mentioned previously. There are a number of scenarios that needs to be considered when talking about autonomous driving. So at the end, it's, it's always leading us to the data and actually some jobs which will process this data. But in autonomous driving area, we can divide four main steps. So the first one is data ingestion, because when the new feature is being developed, it's always well tested in the cars. So when the cars is used to test some new feature, the data is being collected, it needs to be uh, later loaded to the uh, to the platform and pre-processed. So of course we need to orchestrate this job somehow. So this is the first of the data ingestion. The next one is machine learning. So this is of course something uh, most probably the most interesting part uh, part here. So this is also let's say separate type of jobs that we need to orchestrate. We have also uh, jobs called reprocessing and simulation. So for simulation. It's not always the case that the car needs to actually drive because not all scenarios are possible to, let's say, uh, to, to, to prepare them in, on the road. Some, are, some, some scenarios needs to, be, uh, needs to be simulated. And the reprocessing, it means that using the data we already collected, we are able to uh, use the, the approach called hardware in a loop and software in a loop to actually check how particular hardware or software devices in the, uh, in the car behaves. When the, uh, some input data will be will be will be uh, uh, provided to them, so looking at these types of jobs, we can easily distinguish that for sure we will need some or, uh, orchestrator tool that is giving us the possibility to submit Spark jobs because majority of our data ingestion is is done in, in the Spark jobs. Uh, we also uh, knew that part of the deployment, of the development work will be actually covered by Python applications. So it was also important to have a tool, uh, the orchestrator that will work well with Python applications. And last but not least, a great part of our uh, robotic drive platform is a Kubernetes cluster, more specifically the OpenShift. 
And uh, basically, the, the, the big part is also containerized and uh, put, uh, started on the, on the Kubernetes cluster. So also integration with Kubernetes was very important for us. Considering all this built, we, uh, and, and uh, taking into consideration that Airflow has a lot of operators and also a possibility to create specific operators when such requirement will be needed, we have chosen Airflow. Also because of scalability and, and the active community, like, like I've mentioned, all these points which were listed in the previous slides were, were well covered here. And right now I will just show you quickly how, how our journey from POC to production looked like, because uh, basically it was not very, not very simple and straightforward. We learned a lot since last year. And right now we just wanted to, to, to share this, uh, share this knowledge a little bit with you. So our initial work with Airflow started somewhere in between first and second quarter of 2019. Uh, we have chosen the, the newest uh, available uh, version at this point in time, so the Airflow 1.2. And looking up the available executors, we have chosen a Celery executor as the one we would like to use. Uh, for the backend, both for the Celery backend as, uh, as well as Airflow backend, we have chosen PostgreSQL and the RabbitMQ, which acted as a message broker. So when we finally configure it in a way that each of these components were able to communicate with each other and everything was, was, uh, was uh, running uh, fine without any problems. Uh, of course, like, like it was mentioned before, uh, we have deployed it as an OpenShift project, so on top of the, of the OpenShift cluster. Uh, when we have started it, uh, we thought that, okay, we can trigger some simple tasks, but how it will behave under heavy load? And the heavy load is also some relative, uh, let's say, statement because for one heavy load means 100 tasks and for other means few thousands of tasks. So at the very first stage, we have noticed that when we try to trigger more than 100 jobs, we are actually experiencing some first problem. And the first bottleneck was, of course, the database connection. So there is, uh, right now it's, it's quite obvious, but uh, when we started our journey with Airflow, it was, it was uh, more like a, let's say, black box. Uh, and uh, the relation with, between the number of tasks running on Airflow and number of open database connections is directly proportional. So uh, our first bottleneck was a very limited number of um, maximum allowed connections on the, open, uh, on the database level on Postgres. So here we, we solved it by introducing the PG Bouncer, so it acts very well. And later, after we have adapted also the Airflow configuration file and uh, tuned a little bit the scheduler uh, parameters, et cetera, where we are able to achieve uh, something uh, close to 1,000 tasks running uh, in parallel at the same time in the cluster with no, uh, with no problems. Uh, that was enough at uh, something like a year ago. Right now, we are working actively on scaling up Airflow even more. Uh, and that was uh, that was basically how the how our beginnings of Airflow look like. And as I've mentioned at the at the, at the previous uh, slides, uh, at the beginning we considered Airflow as a black box, so it's something that needs, of course, some other components to make sure that it's up and running. However, we don't want to go into the source code and understand how things works because we are we do not need that right now. We uh, also know knew that we can apply some custom modifications if it will be required. But for now, we just wanted to use the, the official uh, version which is released and apply no changes there. However, uh, after, let's say, a few first weeks with Airflow, we noticed some limitations, something that might be uh, improved in terms of how we are using Airflow to make it, make it even better. And uh, most of our changes are related to the uh, Spark Summit operator and Spark Summit hook. So the first change, this is basically something really small. It, it's just a few lines of code, but I wanted to say about it because for us it was a breaking change because here we actually forked Airflow repository, made some change, uh, built the Docker image from our, uh, from our uh, source code. And that was a starting point when we considered each new change in the Airflow source code as something not as you know far away and something that we can we can possibly possibly do with, uh, without any any problems. So uh, the first thing was related to the properties file of, uh, parameter in the operator constructor. So uh, we basically each each Spark submit job on the cluster uh, we provided uh, the configuration using the properties file. 
And this is something that was by default not supported in, in Airflow, but we, we have added it and basically we were able to uh, use the same Spark Summit command as on the, as on the jobs for the cluster with no special, uh, let's say, adaption required. And also uh, we have uh, changed a little bit the templating, which is used for Spark Summit operator to make sure that a uh, few additional uh, arguments can be also templated. So uh, in our case, it gives us some better DAC reusability and, and possibility to use uh, one DAC instead of multiples and parameterize few input parameters using, using templates. And here comes a little bit, um, let's say different, Thing because because when we started uh, doing some custom implementations, we have noticed that there are even more uh, things that might be optimized. And uh, most probably for all of those who are working with the Spark applications, uh, you know that when we are submitting a job uh, to the R with cluster mode, basically from the Spark submit command, we have no clear information under which application ID the job uh, is uh, being submitted. We have this application ID only when the job fails, uh, however, in our uh, deployment, we wanted to, as, as the Airflow was the default uh, orchestrator, we wanted to have a possibility to track basically the journey, which applications, which components are processing which sort of data. So, for example, in the Airflow logs, we would like to have information that if right now the Spark job is triggered, we would like to know under which application ID it was submitted in YARN. If it was, for example, Kubernetes job, we would like to have information about the pod name, et cetera. So here we also uh, identified that there are a few other uh, fields that might be worth to, to add, like the tracking URL to also have the, uh, the link to the logs and the diagnostic part from YARN. So if the job fails, for example, uh, we have uh, a stack trace from driver directly in the airflow logs. So it means that, that the debugging is much faster because we do not need to go to the YAML logs in most of the cases. Uh, we, have, we are able to achieve it uh, using the YARN Resource Manager REST API. So in our implementation, the Spark Summit hook is generating the custom UID, uh, which is uh, added to the, to the YARN tags as a property. The job with this tag is submitted to the cluster, and when it's finished, successfully or not, uh, the Spark Submit hook sends another uh, REST call to the YARN Resource Manager REST API and get uh, the details of the application that will be uh, that might be interesting for us. And last but not least, uh, the other change that we also implemented, which is not related to the operators, is the custom class for the REST API authentication. We are actively using the, the, the experimental REST API and to meet all the uh, requirements that a robotic drive platform uh, face and uh, also have a possibility to configure a permission to the REST API user in Airflow uh, using LDAP and Active Directory, we uh, specified a custom class which is doing an authentication for LDAP uh, and, and basically is also checking if the user which is submitting the role uh, belongs to the current role, uh, which is submitting the DAC belongs to the current uh, and, and, uh, correct role uh, on the active directory level. Uh, we had some discussions uh, because there were ideas that more, maybe for each endpoint it would be good to specify some separate roles, etc. on the active directory level. However, for now we have just very simple verification here. Uh, we are acting more in a, in a let's say, binary uh, way right now, so either user has access to the REST API or not. So this is the, let's say, current implementation here. And uh, using all these, let's say, custom features we have prepared and collecting all, let's say, experience we, 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 uh, we got during last uh, year, uh, because what I'm sharing right now is just a, just a nutshell. If you would like to go through the entire journey, I think that the, the session should take much more time. However, uh, we finally achieved uh, the state where we have a uh, production ready Airflow instance. So on Robotic Drive platform, we have three Airflow instances, the development staging and production. So the development is the instance where we are mostly testing new, new features related to the Airflow deployment, to uh, new versions of Airflow when, when they are released, or some custom implementation we need to make. The staging is the, let's say, 
stable environment where when users can test the DAX. So from the Airflow deployment point of view, from the Airflow setup, it should be considered as a stable environment. And production uh, more or less contains exactly the same, uh, let's say, version as staging, but scaled in a larger uh, way. So for example, in production, we have much, much, much better uh, version in terms of the number of workers, resources, etc., to make sure that uh, we can uh, we can uh, run more uh, jobs on the production cluster. And the current stable setup uh, which we are using, uh, we have the Airflow 1 and 10 and the Zeller Executor. This is what fits the best for us uh, for now. And uh, one additional thing is that we basically wanted to also uh, we noticed that users has a lot of have a lot of problems with, uh, for example, testing the DAX in parallel because we have just three instances. So which which one is production? So only two instances where they can test it, and for example, two or three users are doing some uh, changes in the same DAG, which are somehow inter interfering each other. It means that uh, they are basically blocking each other during the implementation phase. And because we used the uh, Helm charts for deployment, and our Airflow setup is created on top of Kubernetes, more specifically OpenShift, uh, we uh, went into the direction to fully parameterize the deployment and make it possible for users to spin up their own Airflow instances uh, on demand. So basically, when they want to create new Airflow instance, they are able to do it uh, directly via just one Helm chart, and they are not blocked by any other uh, changes that will uh, that will uh, be uh, done on the cluster at the same point in time. Okay, and here I will take over to Amr. Yes, I am. OK, so um, just a few more slides before we open the room for questions and answers. Uh, we wanted to shed some light on the monitoring of Airflow. Um, so we have already implemented some dashboards in Grafana based on the metrics collected, whether from StatsD uh, on Airflow or from um, uh, Kubernetes, where we monitor continuously monitor the resource utilization and usage of the uh, scheduler of the different Airflow components in general. Uh, here, here I'm just displaying a screenshot of the scheduler and web server component, and we, we've been doing some tests over the last few days, and we can clearly see uh, how um, how much memory and how much CPU usage is is required by the scheduler and web server, and this actually helps us a lot to further stabilize and uh, fine tune Airflow in general. Uh, here is also another quick monitoring dashboard uh, where we are looking closely into PG Bouncer uh, and Postgres as well, uh, just to see uh, again uh, how many active connections there are between uh, Airflow and the database and how much uh, resources are needed here. Um, this is also a third dashboard that I wanted to shed some light on and that's about the DAG processing runtime. And this is a parameter that we learned of uh, by complete coincidence when we had some performance issues and bottlenecks in Airflow. And uh, thank thanks to the Airflow community on Slack, um, I think it was Kamil, if I recall correctly, he pointed us to the DAG processing runtime. And that's basically the process that is uh, running for each DAG and checking how, I mean, basically processing, processing uh, processing the different DAG runs of a particular DAG. And this is very crucial because as soon as this times out, then the process times out and it has some impact and it, one can start noticing that either his DAGs has some delays or even they start they stop uh, operating at all. Um, I didn't see a lot of uh, literature around this uh, on, the, on the internet, but um, I thought it would be a good chance to raise awareness for the different uh, users out there. Um, now, uh, since we are almost out of time, uh, what's next? What we are looking forward to, based on our experiences, uh, we see that, uh, I mean, the very most thing we are looking forward for in Airflow 2.0 is the highly available scheduler and the performance optimizations. We're actually already having some bottlenecks, bottleneck performance issues with Airflow 1.10. And uh, we are in the process of heavily testing Airflow 2.0 to see if, if it indeed addresses our, our issues or if it requires further fine tuning there. 
Um, based on our, our experiences with the different customers we are working with, uh, uh, advanced authentication and authorization is needed because it's not that the customer just wants to block everyone out and let themselves in, but actually different teams within uh, the end users should have different access rights. Uh, we believe in monitoring a lot and it helps us a lot with the fine tuning and optimization of airflow. So we believe there are still actually some room for extending and stabilizing some of the monitoring metrics. And this is something we would actually try to contribute to, uh, to the open source community. And last but not least, this is something also we are expecting from Airflow 2.0 is a stable API versus the currently deployed and chipped experimental API. Um, I apologize, sincerely apologize, apologize for the bad voice quality, at least for the first half of the presentation, but this brings us to the end and uh, we would like to open the door for some questions and hopefully answers from our side. Thank you. Okay, um, question. Uh, so, um, Amit, in your opening segment, you mentioned Azure, um, but then you mentioned OpenShift. Um, how does Azure come into play? Sorry, how does what come into play? Uh, Azure, which you mentioned, you know, Microsoft Azure. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so basically, um, um, in our particular case, at least at the, the use case we were discussing today, the customer has a cluster that is built uh, on-premise. It's not connected to the internet. So that's why we had to depend on the, our different, our own tools and our different um, services and platform uh, applications that are already installed. Nevertheless, we believe that because of the highly customizable Helm charts that we have built on, um, that basically deploying on Azure should something should be something straightforward to achieve we didn't did not try this ourselves in the past but we believe it's it shouldn't be that uh, that much of a blocker for us gotcha great that makes sense thank you um the question um are you able to submit your customizations to the hooks and operators back upstream to to airflow Yes, so uh, basically we were internally discussing this possibility. Uh, the, the thing which uh, we see, um, maybe not a problem, but something we need to align, is that partially the uh, modifications uh, around the operators and hooks were done specifically for a, for a, um, for a customer. And we need to align with them if, uh, if, we are able, if we are basically allowed to share the source code with the community. And the other thing is that it was done um, for uh, the let's say um, for our uh, deployment where we used Mapper, so uh, for sure we would need to inter uh, test it with other uh, hardware distributions just to make sure that uh, it's basically something that everyone can reuse. But this is this is something we are working on, and yeah, if we'll have a green light from the customer, of course we will. We are keen to contribute. Great, look forward to them if you can get them. Hopefully. Um, uh, is PG Bouncer necessary? Um, kind of, like, I guess. Did you did you experience connection problems with Postgres? Yes. Yeah, so uh, Michal has already discussed this. So at some point, as we started stress testing our Airflow deployment, which was connected directly towards Postgres, we very quickly reached the connection limits of Postgres. Of course, there is the option of increasing the connection limits on the Postgres side, but uh, there is the, there is always a limit, and we cannot just go high uh, high enough for Airflow. I mean, uh, we were talking about, uh, I think if I recall correctly, that's something we had last year. Basically each running task had for some reason two open connections towards the database, at least in the earlier versions of Airflow. And this made us very quickly hit the limits there. And that's what that's why we actually encourage using PG Bouncer in case we expect high, high number of concurrent tasks and jobs running. Yeah, uh, I guess to, to follow up on that, I, I've seen I've seen three or four connections per worker process as well. So it definitely kind of very quickly can exhaust them. Um, okay, great. Let me just check if we have any more questions. Um, no, that's it. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, enjoy your break. And uh, we will be back in a little over 15 minutes for the next session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day.